Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Hardscape Growth Show. My name is Alex. I'm your host. And today we are joined by Art Kunkel. He is the Vice President of Sales of Warming Trends. You may have heard of these guys. They are heating things up across the hardscape industry uh, throughout North America. They make some fantastic natural gas and liquid propane burner options for outdoor fire features. And that's what we're talking about today. Here with Art. How are you doing, Art? Great, thanks. Now, Art, you've been with uh, Warming Trends in this position for four years, but um, people who don't know you may not know, you have almost two decades of experience in this specific field in our industry. You're giving away my age, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> well, experience is a, a very good thing, especially when we're talking about uh, products that, if installed incorrectly, could, uh, could go boom, and we don't want that. Very true. So we're going to uh, today hopefully get through a few topics to help uh, our listeners understand the incredible opportunity that exists with um, fire features in the outdoor living industry. Uh, I don't think either of us have the opinion that this is a tremendous opportunity for anybody in the industry. I think it's proven time and time again that uh, one of the easiest ways to add revenue, to add value to your projects and to your company and to the services that you're offering to your customers is to include fire features. They're the number one searched uh, outdoor living aspect online, which just goes to show how much demand there is for them. And they're not that complicated to install. No, and that's one fact that's often overlooked. If, if I can, Alex, you've characterized this as a big opportunity in outdoor living. We sell projects, even modest projects, that are pretty expensive. In many cases, the end user, whether it's a business or consumer, has four to five months of good weather in which to enjoy the spend that they make. Adding a fire feature extends the season for enjoyable and comfortable use when the days become shorter, when the mercury and the leaves fall, fire is a place to gather, it's a source of light, it's a source of warmth. If you're trying to persuade an end user that there's a better return on investment, fire is a great way to do that. Yeah, I liked what you say about, about <laughs> and, and we're, we're recording this right now, uh, I don't know about the weather near you, but the, a foot of snow just fell outside here. <laughs> like it's the dead of winter uh, for us. But I know that all I have to do is just get some snow off the cover of my fire pit at home. And if I want to sit outside and have uh, a nice, uh, a nice uh, beverage to keep the inside of my body warm by the fire with my wife tonight, I know I can do that very easily. Just fire it up. And it's one of the best things that we added to our backyard. And I think any homeowner anywhere, once they've added the fire pit to their backyard, would say the same because it, it just becomes a focal point. It adds that warmth, like you said, but it's also a source of light. It really, it really transforms an outdoor living space. And, and there's the weather part that you just mentioned. But the other part is most of our homeowners get to enjoy their properties at night. And that source of light cannot be understated. No, that's really true. I, it's a place to gather one of the, in, I think, underappreciated aspects of a fire feature. I've never seen someone sit next to a fire and look at their phone. You know, we're constantly engaged with social media. We don't pay attention to one another. If you walk up to a fire feature with a glass of wine in one hand and a snack in the other, you can bet the phone's going to be in the pocket. So at any rate, the, the point that I wanted to make is, Selling a big project can be difficult. And to the extent that we can explain to an end user that they're going to have nine months, 10 months of mm -hmm. enjoyable use, I think it makes it an easier sale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like you said, they're not, they're not inexpensive, um, but they are pretty sizable investments. Now, a, a natural gas or liquid propane fire feature like you said, it's not the, the cheapest investment to make in your backyard, but if you can show that, that return on investment in terms of usable days throughout the year, I think, um, I think it's an easier sell, like you said. What's I agree, a, yeah. Go ahead. What, what, would, what would you say, like, um, because a lot of contractors, just from my experience with my 20-ish my years in the industry too, um, 
when I talk to contractors who are not offering these features right now, there are a lot of uncertainties and a lot of big question marks that make it re- make them reluctant to add them to uh, to their projects. Um, when you look at the industry, knowing that most hardscapers are not leveraging the power of fire to really um, add value to their their customers' experience and, and to their projects, uh, what would you say? What would you say to them? Well, on the projects for outdoor living, and again, whether for a residence or a business, have broadened and now include irrigation, lighting, water features, audio, electrical. And I think to the extent that those are left um, on the sideline, a hardscaper is leaving an opportunity, you know, unconverted. So that's one thing. And in terms of difficulty, on the evolutionary scale of difficulty, installing a fire feature is a two or three, whereas you know a, a project-wide audio might be a seven or eight. There's not much to it. Um, there's planning involved in burying a gas line before the hardscape is placed. Mm-hmm. And beyond that, um, you have a plumber or a gas technician make a connection, and everything that's north of the key valve is simple and easy to use. If there's one common piece of feedback that we get from contractors that have installed for the first time, it is, I had no idea it was this easy. I've been doing this a long time ago. You know, we look forward to doing so many more. It's, it's not cookie cutter, but it's darn close. Yeah. You know, it's actually funny because on a few of our showcase projects over the years, uh, Tech Block Contractor Showcase, uh, where we build a project every year with some contractors, um, the past few years, the fire pits that we built, it was the first time for those contractors building a gas fire pit. And they said the same thing. Like, if I knew it was this easy, I would have been doing this years ago. And you're just, you're leaving those opportunities aside. Just like you said, water features, crazy easy to install with the right products. Outdoor lighting, crazy easy to install with the right products. So it's a question of doing a little bit of research and hopefully you know, a show like this kind of kickstarts that research phase for you, but doing a little bit of research, understanding what goes into the build, understanding what the costs associated to that are. And then as so many other contractors who have been on our show so far have said, you just, you commit to doing them, offer them to the customer. If they want it, commit to building it. And there are so many resources out there to help you, including people at warming trends who are able to, to walk people through the process. Can you, uh, can you give us kind of a, um, a step-by-step, but really high level? I've never built a, a, a fire feature before. I want to get started. What, do I, what are the things I need to consider? What are the steps? What do I need to know? Yeah, the first thing is, what's the fuel type? Is it liquid propane or natural gas? And I say that only in our case because the burners are specific to the fuel type. Okay. The next thing is to understand where the client wants the fire feature. And I say that because the distance from the meter is significant in planning. There is pressure drop with gas, whether LP or natural gas, in distance from the meter. And if there's one expression that we try to drive home that we really emphasize with somebody doing this for the first time, it is all things are possible until the gas line is buried. There, there's almost no amount of engineering that will compensate for an insufficient amount of fuel. And there's nothing more demoralizing as a manufacturer than hearing somebody say, I had a 250 foot run and I ran a three eighths inch gas line. You know, there's, there will be a flame, but it certainly is not gonna be optimal. So from the standpoint of first steps, it's plan and understand that you need to deliver the specified amount of fuel at the uh, feature. Once that's done, then again, grade and level, the same thing that you would do for Hardscape, give us or you know from whomever you would buy the product, dimensions of the opening. You need to have a plate and burner that somewhat fit the opening. A plate should be within a half inch of the size of the opening so that media does not fall in the gap between the plate and the inside wall of the feature. The so hold on, I'm gonna stop you one second. Ahead. So the plate basically is what is supporting 
the decorative gravel or glass or whatever that goes around the burner. That's what you're referring to. So I need to know that's what's correct. the size of the fire pit. I need to put a plate in there that's going to be supported on the inside that I can put the media and the burner on, right? Correct. That's, okay. that's very accurate. Yes. And then from the standpoint of a burner, we have, uh, I think, 140 stock sizes of burners and most manufacturers that supply are going to have some number. We try to avoid, we maintain an easement between the burner and the inside wall, the feature of at least four inches. And the reason is not to transfer heat from the burner to the capstone. A product like TechoBlock is, is not going to be subject to breakdown by virtue of the heat that that feature would uh, emit. But some natural stone, bluestone, if it's wet and dry, if it's wet and warm, it can crack. So at any rate, we make the burner slightly smaller than the plate. Um, and we have burners that are recommended for virtually any opening size. And then once the burner and plate are known, you match it with a flex line and key valve. We say a flex line because it enables you to make connections with a surplus of line so that the plate and burner can be above the feature itself. And after the connections are made, you, drop you can it into rest place. The, Exactly. Okay. And then if ever service is needed, you have the reverse process. So if I just, uh, is this is a podcast and I know there's a video version too, but we don't have any diagrams going. So I'm just going to try to paint a picture here. So I've got my project. I've got the home. I've got the location of the fire feature. I have checked with someone like obviously with the homeowner to know if it's natural gas or liquid propane, how do I know the volume or the output of fuel that's going to that fire feature? Who tells me that? Well, there's, there's two or three ways of knowing you can literally Google gas line size chart, and it will give you distance from the meter and the number of BTUs that are available based on the line size. So typically, and, and Alex, what most of the calls re we received would be along the lines of, hey, I've got a rectangular feature. It's 48 inches long, 24 inches wide. Uh -huh. What burner would you recommend? And we tell them. And at that point, they may say, I need 240,000 BTUs so they can look up that chart. That chart, incidentally, is on the resources page of our website. Okay. But one, one disclaimer related to that chart we have found that it's better to consult a local gas tech or plumber. And that's really for two reasons. One reason is in the part of the world where I live, if you have natural gas, the average residential pressure is 0.19 PSI. In some other parts of the country, it can be 0.25, it can be 0.15. So that has a great effect on what, okay. what's delivered downstream. So that's one factor. And then the other factor is in many cases, the line that's run includes a pool heater, an outdoor kitchen, you know, other appliances. All those other things are drawing. Right. And, and if yeah. that's not disclosed at the time that somebody does the search, they can make a big mistake. Mm -hmm. So we always recommend that they consult a local gas professional and or a plumber. And either one can give them a really accurate opinion on what fuel will be available to feature. So would you recommend... And I'm going to get back to painting the picture in a second here. But would you recommend that if I'm trying to bid one of these projects for the first time um, to get a budgetary number or to be able to get a, a good idea with the client before proceeding with anything, I could Google gas line size chart to understand what my needs would be. I could contact uh, a local gas technician or plumber, get my subcontracting pricing to have an idea, but that that actual rate would be finalized upon signature of the contract. We would have the plumber come out and, and do a check and confirm that. And if we cannot do that, then we would apply a change order to the contract. Is that the recommended way to do it? That's exactly how to do it. Okay. So that way I, I'm giving the client a really good idea. I've done the research, but we're not spending money until we're all committed. Like, yeah, okay, we're going to do it. Then I'll get the plumber to come out. Plumber comes out, he confirms we're good to go. And if we're not good to go, well, that's what a change order is for. And we can decide that we're keeping the fire pit or we're removing it because you don't want to pay that extra amount if that happens. But at least like that, I've covered myself as a contractor and I've set the expectations correctly for the homeowner. 
So we've True. established yes. that part. Perfect. So I got the house. I got the gas. I got the gas line requirements that I've researched online. I've gotten confirmed by my plumber. I have my trench dug out. My trench is probably going to run below my hardscaping uh, in most cases. Um, would you recommend that you take the shortest path possible to lose as little pressure as possible? Just go straight line if you can. Yes, unless there's a break in the hardscape such that if ever work needed to be done, you know, you wouldn't have to go right through the middle of the, the plan. But just on the thought of excavation, Alex, mm. two things to keep in mind. One is most residential installs are match light or push button ignition. Okay. So they don't require electrical, not 110 AC. Oh, uh, true. In, in spite of that. When people have that excavation done, we normally recommend that they put down a plastic conduit, a raceway. If ever in the future they want to switch to an electronic ignition, if ever they want, you know, some other element. And it's That's there's so quite smart. a bit of LED downlighting yeah. now that goes under the capstone. That it's a great effect. And again, after the fact, to to uproot hardscape is a significant expense mm -hmm. and great inconvenience. Whereas if at the time you trench, you just include a raceway, it's tremendously inexpensive. And it's a part of the plan that if you address at the outset, is very easy. That's super smart. Actually, we, we, uh, we even recommend like if you're even if you're not going to put lighting in, if you work with low voltage lighting systems, it might not be a bad idea to run your low voltage wiring because it's so inexpensive. You just run it all through. Just like you said, if I got to go under, run the conduits there. So that if you do want to upgrade down the road, it's doable, it's manageable, and it's palatable from a budgetary perspective for the client. Now, that's a super smart piece of advice. So I've got my trench. I'm taking as direct a line as possible to the fire feature without without you know potentially creating issues for repairs down the road. I don't want to be going under like a million structures, but if it's just under a strip of pavement, that's fine. Right. I've run my additional conduit for any electrical, whether it is current or whether it be in the future. I got my gas line that runs up into the center of my newly constructed fire feature. So I got my gas line up and that's when I would call my plumber. He'd do the hookup. We drop the plate in with the burner, put the media in and we'd be good. What about vents and uh, ignition? Now, you mentioned uh, most of the systems in North America are push button or matchlet. Matchlet literally means light a match, toss it in. Poof, there you go. And push button is just like on a, on a barbecue or a grill, right? The little like double A battery, push the button, click, 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 and it goes. Yeah, correct on both counts. Hey, I don't want to bypass the vent question. Um, just for those who haven't worked with the fuel in the past, natural gas is lighter than air. Okay. And if ever there were a leak, if ever a child opened the key valve and, and gas escaped, it's going to dissipate. Okay. Liquid propane is heavier than air. So it's And six. it will collect in the vessel like water in a bucket. Uh -huh. And that can be very dangerous. We provide vents. And in fact, there's a national guideline that recommends 18 square inches of venting on opposing sides of the feature. And it's way less to facilitate the the burn and way more to provide for dissipation of fuel if ever a leak occurs. And again, it's very unlikely, but that's a precaution in terms of expense and planning that's minimal mm -hmm. and it provides a great benefit in terms of safety over the life of the feature. So, and then in terms of ignition, um, most people will use a butane lighter, you know, a barbecue lighter to light the feature, but you can approach the feature. The key valve is a quarter turn ball valve turn it slightly to the left or counterclockwise, present an ignition source, the burner lights. When you're at the key valve, obviously you can adjust the flame height from anywhere, you know, I'd say in the vicinity of four inches to 24 inches. And that may not seem like an important feature, but for people who <laughs> live in the part of the world that I do, you want to dial that back at times. Yeah. It's a little too warm. I exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, we've had, customers um, comment that a glass of wine and or the the bottoms of their shoes yeah. can be overheated if they put their, their feet up on the side yep. of the feature. So again, that's not out. a joke. These no, Trans transburgers, they got hot, man. The one we built last year, uh, I was standing 10 feet away from it and I could feel the heat coming off of it. So like if you want to go hard with the heat, 
these burners are, are nuts and, and a 24 inch flame is not like you just said, it's not out of the realm of possibility with warming trends. No. And the, the burner that you're describing, the feature that you're describing was 480,000 BTUs. Yeah. That's, that's roughly the BTU draw of a pool heater, but it's considering it that it, yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that, that's very true. I mean, I can see that for, we are based in Colorado and yeah. Denver. And if you go to Breckenridge, Copper Mountain, Vail, Aspen, all the resorts have features that are enormous in terms of radius, mm -hmm. but they can also sit, you know, 20 patrons and all of them have the benefit of heat. So mm -hmm. there's a there's a place, I think, for an application of a really big burner. And in most instances, it's a commercial venue. So let me ask you. Um one of the reasons that we have you on the show is obviously you're super, super knowledgeable about all of this stuff. And uh, like we were saying, even before we got started here, like I've built a few of these, but I'm not an expert. You've built hundreds of these and, and you've consulted on thousands. Um, but one of the reasons that we have you on the show is because we've kind of teamed up, our two companies have, to make things a lot easier for contractors to be able to offer these features uh, to their clients without the fear of the customization that comes into things. Because let's face it, for a lot of contractors, the, uh, the margins that they make on projects are, are a little tighter than they'd like due to the competitive nature of the industry. And if you want to be able to carve out an edge for yourself, you need to be able to differentiate your offering. But it's kind of a double-edged sword because if you've never built something before, Mistakes can be extremely costly where there's there's not much left in your pocket if it goes wrong. So the learning curve is not necessarily something that, that a lot of guys want to adapt or try on a project. So that's why we've kind of teamed up with all these different fire features that we've come out with. And now Warming Trends has created a bunch of custom fire or, or burner solutions, natural gas and liquid propane, to work with each one of the Tackle Block prepackaged fire features. Can you tell us a little bit about what those burners are and kind of what, what, what's included in these packages? Yeah, and I, I hate to start with a tired cliche, but time is money. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest benefits of these kits is similar to the feature itself. No cuts are required. So we had a conversation about vents. Yeah. Vents will be included. They are sized to replace, perfectly replace a block and to support the block above it. Mm -hmm. So no cuts are required. You simply extract the block, insert the vent. There's no ledger, no extra arrangements. Likewise, when you mentioned the push button ignition system, we've developed a mounting bracket that again, is unique to the block size. So the one for Valencia is not interchangeable with the one for Raffinato or Prescott or Brandon. That's right. they're, they're each unique. So on that mounting bracket is a knockout for the key valve and a corresponding hole for the push button module. So again, you extract the block, insert that mounting bracket, and there's no cut necessary. So the plate fits, the burner fits. It includes a, an aluminum cover. So if there are months of the year when the burner's not being used and you put that cover on it, mm -hmm. kids can run across it, you can rest the flower pot, um, it's very durable. It'll stay in place in case of bad weather. And that's something that yeah. in the central U.S. we have examples Badass. of that same yeah. way on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, these these kits, it, it'll do two things. One is it does save the contractor time and difficulty. But the other one is aesthetically, I have seen some horribly mutilated vents. As guys try to use a circ saw to cut a vent or something at a job site, and that's not always the case, yeah. but the easier we can make it, I think the more that those accessories are up to the standard of cosmetics and appearance that the block itself is. So that's exactly what we tried to accomplish. And that's a fair point because the reality is like one of the biggest challenges our whole industry faces and whether it be installing blocks or installing fire features is, is there's a bit, not a bit, there is a shortage of skilled labor. That's one of the reasons why we started hardscaper is to be able to pro provide more education and more learning opportunities for people new to the industry or people in this, in the industry who are trying to learn new skills. It's one of the reasons why we have this podcast is to share more of that knowledge and that experience. But the reality still remains that there's a shortage of skilled labor. So 
having the opportunity to buy products and packages that reduce the need for the, for the skill and the experience and are really more about assembling and following instructions that still don't remove the craftsmanship involved in hardscaping uh, because the last thing we want to do is devalue what the contractor brings to the equation. It, the, they're the most essential part. But if we can make it a little bit easier where we can get the grade set right and we can get the guys on building the structure, popping the vents in, popping the ignition in, and then we get the subcontractor in to do the gas hookup, we're in a way better position than if we got to figure out how we're going to grind this out to cut out the vent, what's going to support the subsequent course of block above it, how do we get that ignition system in there so it's locked in so when I'm turning the key it's not wobbling or coming unglued or any of that. Together, we figure that all out where now it's, I buy my product, I buy a Prescott fire pit, I have the blocks, everything is prepared, I just follow the instructions, where I need to put a vent, I just put the vent right in, it locks in, where I need to put the ignition, I put that in, it locks right in, I drop in my, uh, my uh, burner plate, my burner, put in my media, glue down my cap, Bob's your uncle. That's it, and that's all it takes. And liquid uh, propane, or natural gas. I want to touch on another thing because you said durable. Uh, we already know our products come with a lifetime transferable warranty. And one of the reasons why Warming Trends is uh, working together with Techos because you guys have a killer warranty too, right? Yeah, it's lifetime on the brass burner. We, You could throw a brass burner in the ocean, come back 10 years later and scrape off the barnacles and it's ready to use. It won't rust. There's no corrosion. It's you know very durable even to drops and bends. Aluminum plates are similarly resistant to corrosion. Mm -hmm. The parts beneath the plate, likewise. It may so, be outside. Yeah, it's, they're, they're ideal for outdoor use. And again, with a little bit of care. And when I say a little bit of care, that's if putting if, the cover it, on, that's all you have to do. Keep leaves, dirt, debris, and in some cases, big snow melt off mm -hmm. it. And you have no other maintenance to do to the feature. And that's, that's so huge because the last thing that people want is something that's going to be a pain in their butt in five years or 10 years. And there are a lot of burner options out there. We're not going to name names, but there are a lot of brands that uh, where components are imported from overseas, fabricated overseas. They're not using the same gauge uh, uh, materials. Uh, that may not be using brass at all, but they're not using the same gauge. Uh, the, the finer components that, that connect the pieces together may not be of the same quality. And, and that stuff really makes a difference. You, you build a fire pit and you have a burner that fails within five years, you, you make that mistake once, in my opinion, because you, when you deal with that customer, you understand that you don't want to deal with that again, especially if you need to replace the burner because it may yeah, require I mean, disassembly I of the whole fire pit. There's almost nothing more expensive as an installer contractor than having to send somebody back to a mm -hmm. job you did a year ago. So I try to look at it from their point of view. They should install it and forget it. It should work forever. When the house falls down, the burner should still work. So, I mean, that's our goal. And when you mentioned materials, mm -hmm. the plates on which we rest the burner are quarter inch aluminum. If we have long runs for any reason, we go to three eighths. The brass is either half inch or three quarter inch, and it's not copper pipe. All pieces are machined on a CNC machine. If you could see the size of the opening relative to the outside diameter, it's really durable. And that heft is something that you can feel, that substance, as soon as you pick one up. Mm -hmm. So it, it does what it look, looks like and it survives for a long time. Yeah, having, having built uh, quite a few with, with your products and having built with other products and having built with a bunch of custom solutions too. I, I've experienced a, a bit of all of the above. And, um, you know, obviously through TechoBlock, we have these, these prepackaged kits that make things easy. But if you do need to go full custom and just the burners that we're offering aren't the right option, definitely going to warming trends and getting that custom fabrication done is 
the right way to go. And I'm not just saying that because you're on the show. I'm saying that from my own personal experience, trying to find a local fabricator to make me the right aluminum size panels. And then trying to think like, is this the right gauge? Is that the right gauge? What's the span? How am I going to brace it all? Like this is the only thing that you guys do. And I cannot stress this enough for any, any contractor, find people who are really specialized and find people who, uh, who don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk. Find people who actually work with their products, who build with their products, who are involved on job sites because they can give you the firsthand experience and they can give you real support and not just what the manual says. And I think that's one of the, the big things that that's led to uh, our success at Tackle Block. I think it's a big thing that's led to, to your success with warming trends. You, you guys have tripled your business in the past few years, right? Yeah, we sure have. And that, again, doesn't happen, that doesn't happen by fluke. No, but it's a perfect time to express a little appreciation to the guys that are tramping around in the mud and slinging block because were it not for them, neither of us would have the bounty that we do. So I sure appreciate that. But hey, the other thing is, as you were describing custom, one of the observations we've made is that Teco block is a material that specifiers love. And in some cases, designers have a a creative impulse that they just can't suppress. Mm -hmm. We have prepackaged features. And obviously, for the contractor that wants to build one and move on, that's a great solution. Mm -hmm. For the guy that sits at a drafting table or a you know CAD application, they may have an idea that they want to see realized. And you're right. We've done one recently that was a raffinado. And the designer put two of them end to end and essentially eliminated what would have been the center termination between the two. Okay. So we were, we were able to build a burner that was long enough to fill that space. So again, they may choose to use that material, but in the space that they have to work, they may envision or visualize a different solution. Mm -hmm. And another thing is with all these custom features that we have that, that are, sorry, well, the prepackaged features that we have, we have the burner kits that go with them uh, that can be sold separately to do your own custom stuff too. But with our contractor support manual, techoblock.com slash support dash manual. There's the URL. We'll put it in the description of the show too. But all those um, all those pre-designed features, the the hundred plus pages of fire features, water features, benches, all that stuff, that guide that we have, all the fire features in there, you guys have designed the burners for each one of those too. So although it may not be a stock item, you have the design. So it's not like a, this, this crazy custom fabrication project. You have the specs. It's just make it for me and ship it. Yes. And in most cases, that piece of material is hanging someplace in our shop. It's ready to be mated to a plate and shipped. But hey, you're, the resources that you offer are great. And we are trying to develop the same kind of documentation. In, in the case of the kits that will be shipped for the four prepackaged fire features, mm -hmm. there will be an installation manual inside the bag with the FlexLine kit that, that ha is full of illustrations. It'll, it'll have uh, English, French, uh, and Spanish translation. Fantastic. So at any rate, again, I, I can't emphasize enough. It's less intimidating, less difficult than most contractors that haven't built a feature would assume. That's right. And we have, we have some great videos on our YouTube channel that show us building a couple of these fire features, using the warming trends burners, walking through step-by-step. And uh, for hardscaper.com, our educational site that's entirely free, if you're not signed up yet, you, you owe it to yourself and your business to do it. But Warming Trends is putting together a, a, a fire feature, a fire pit, kind of 101 level class to help contractors determine and basically everything that we talked about. How do I determine the distance? How to discern, determine the output? What type of burner? What are the installations? What are the precautions? All that stuff is going to be put together in that course that's going to be available for free. And when accompanied by a video, it makes far more sense. Mm -hmm. It's also available as a resource to the guy that's on site, overlooking the parts and pieces, preparing to put them together and maybe isn't quite sure. They can look at it on a cell phone. I, I, that's just a fantastic resource. That's right. And that, that's the plan. Exactly. Right there on the spot. I'm building it now. I need to know now. Boom. You have all the resources you need. That, that's the plan. And that's what we're working on. All right. Tell me, what's... Uh, What's like the craziest fire feature you've had the privilege of working on? 
You know, there have been a few, um, one in particular, and this is a little on the parochial side. I lived in St. Louis for 10 okay. years. All right. So there is a facility in St. Louis called the Centene Center, and it's three indoor ice rinks and one outdoor ice rink. And the coach of the Blues, this is where the Blues practice facility is. Yep. Okay. Once a week, they and this is pre-COVID, they practice out of doors. So there are bleachers, uh, and there's actually admission charge, but fans can come and watch practice. We installed a 1 million BTU outdoor burner at the rink. And again, it's one around which it's, I think 14 or 16 chairs will fit. So that was kind of a feather in the cap just from the standpoint of we, we wanted access to that facility. I personally had an investment in seeing that the Blues used one of our burners. But beyond that, probably the most impressive feature, and I think you can probably see it, is one that was done. Oh, yeah. At, I remember seeing at, this on Instagram. That's the Red Rocks Country Club in yeah. Morrison, Colorado. And what made it interesting was that the boulders existed and the contractor used PVC pipe as a template to lace between the boulders. That's he amazing. He glued it. He yeah. glued it. He put the, the PVC in the back of his truck, brought it to the shop. Then we made the burner follow his template, which in turn he took to the site, connected the gas. And that makes a, a real impressive feature. But there's there's a long list. The, the uh, resorts that I mentioned, Beaver Creek, uh, mm -hmm. Breckenridge, you know, those are those are wonderful, too. But um, I, I don't it's hard to to pick one as any more of a favorite than the next. I mean, the, the guy who we just did one for the Chateau in Isla Mirada in the Keys in Florida. OK, that's very impressive. So there are rustic. There are contemporary, there are long, there are, you know, round and fat, but we have the capability to address virtually any design that, you know, an, an architect or designer would, would fancy. So that's just something for people to keep in the back of their mind. And most homeowners are never going to want something that will take that much space or use that much <laughs> fuel. And, and they'll be perfectly satisfied with 160 or 200,000 BTU burner that'll deliver years of enjoyment. That, that was actually one of my questions. So what was that, that BTU level, 160 to 200,000? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that you can actually run, well, to give you an idea, a 20-pound propane tank has a little more than 400,000 BTUs of propane. Okay. So if you have 150, 160,000 BTU burner, you're going to get three to four hours of burn if the key valve is wide open. If it's attenuated at any level at all, you might get six to eight hours. And most people don't plan to run a burner off a 20 pound propane tank, but that's described only so that you have some sense of context. Uh, yeah, that's, for that's what some, everyone knows what a 20 pound tank looks like. Exactly. Yeah. Now, and actually that's a good point because like a lot of people will, will look at fire pits and say, well, you know, I could just do wood burning. That'd be way cheaper. I know in many parts in North America, that's being outlawed like the, the bylaws with the cities and, and counties are, are basically banning wood burning fire features. But uh, beside that, there still is a significant advantage to having a liquid propane or a natural gas. When you, you want a fire, boom, you got a fire. You don't want a fire. It's gone. It's out. Uh, there's not smoke. There's not soot. There's not buckets of ash. You got to shovel and figure out where you're going to dump them. And it, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's, I don't know how to put it. It like the investment up front is a lot more, but the convenience long term is just so much worth it that all you need to do is have one customer agree to it and go back and see them and get a testimonial one year later and see if they would make that investment again. And they'd probably say I would I would have gone bigger. Yeah, it's you're hired, Alex. <laughs> I don't know what else truth. to say. It's well, the, truth. the one you, you made a point about uh, embers, and and only because we're in Denver, Colorado, on the western slope there is a bark beetle, and it has decimated the forest. So it's basically killed the and made tender the entire countryside. Yeah. So on the western slope in the state of Colorado, you cannot burn wood. The embers are too great a risk. The same is true in California. There are some communities around 
Boston that have already adopted the no wood burning yep. uh, rule, or they'll require a spark arrestor if you do uh, burn wood. So that's one component. But the other one you mentioned is the big selling point. I don't have to have wood. I don't have to clean up ash. I don't have to take my clothes to the dry cleaner after we sit around the fire feature. You know, even if you want to roast a marshmallow or a weenie or something, mm. uh, it's it's way more convenient if you can walk out. Turn. It's the microwave of cooking versus the, the wood stove. There you go. I mean, it's that simple. And even the fuel costs, like honestly, unless you live in a more rural area where you can just go and chop your own wood, if you're buying bags of firewood, with the amount of wood that you go through in six hours, when you compare that to the cost of refilling a 20 pound tank of propane, like I do at home, I have, I have a small home in the city. I have a small fire pit, a small yard. Well, I just use 20 pound tanks. I got, I have two, I have a rotation. I just get them refilled. It costs me the same thing that I would buy a few bags of firewood at the store, or I just get the tank refilled for that period of time. The difference is negligible. So honestly, it's really just a question of convenience after the operating costs are the same thing. So yeah, there's they, so they, many they, pros that you, you know, if you're not considering these for your business and you're not offering these to your customers, well, a somebody else is, and I would hate to be the guy losing jobs to the other guy who's just offering a fire pit when they're that easy to add. And B, even if you are getting the jobs and you're not selling the fire pits, you're leaving money on the table and you're, you're under, you're, you're under servicing your customer. You could be giving them more value and more enjoyment out of their property. Your men are there, your equipment are there, you're there. But add a little something, something to the invoice, and it's not exploitation. It's something that customers want and appreciate. Want, it's adding value. It, that's exactly right. They're, they're, what else do you want them to do? Just sit around and stare at each other? Give them something to stare well, at. <laughs> gee, I, I hate to see, I mean, we have some wonderful images of people looking out a window at a snow covered deck. And, you know, why make them wait four or five months for weather to break? When you can get, they can break cabin fever, have a reason to be outside. There you go. There you go. All right. Uh, honestly, this, this has been pretty uh, informative for me. Even though I built a bunch of these, there's a few things that I picked up, uh, especially the, uh, the BTU level, uh, especially with my experience of, of <laughs> over-specking for some pretty massive fires. But uh, honestly, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. Do you have anything hey, else so you want to add? I just want to say we're so happy to be associated with TechoBlock and the point you made about us being available to help a contractor through their first install, there is a battery of people answering phones in Denver at any time of day. Mm -hmm. um, feel free to call if they have questions and the resources like hardscaper.com are going to be there in the future, including video for you. So Absolutely. let's get started. No, you guys, the service level with you guys is phenomenal. I have no negatives to say at all. Nothing at all. Even our first time, I didn't know what I was doing. And we called, we had the support, zero questions there. Best, best, best partner you could possibly work with when it comes to these types of products. What's the best way for people to, uh, to get in touch with, uh, with warming trends if they have these questions or, or maybe if they want to connect with you or a member of your team, who, who should we direct people to? Cause that's a big part of the show is connecting people so that you have direct access to the answers you want. So one, my email address is art. A-R-T at warming-trends.com. The main number in Denver is 303-346-2224. And again, there's any one of probably seven or eight people who could answer the phone and lead you through the simplest to the most complex pro uh, project. And they're happy to do that. That's why we have people answering the phone. So either one of those would be great. Um, they're more than welcome to call me on 901-292-3350. That's you know, your cell. Got, that's my cell number. <laughs> oh, boy. Make it ring. <laughs> Careful what you wish for, my friend. Yeah, well, we're, we're kind of used to that. I field, in some cases, 40 to 50 calls a day through the summer. Wow. And we look at every one of those as an annuity. Again, when you help somebody through the first project, the next one is so much easier. You mm -hmm. may never hear from them again, but the POs continue to come in. That's that's it, man. That's the way to look at it. Help a customer, and then they can, if they can take care of themselves, you're you're winning. And that's that value. And as a contractor, you can do the same thing. 
help the homeowner get the most out of their investment and they will be thrilled. And the next time for an investment, they're coming back to you. And if they know anyone who's ready to make that kind of investment, they're swinging that business your way. So exactly. it's win, yeah. win, win. We all, we all benefit when we do these things. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's been a real pleasure and I uh, can't wait to have you on again. Thanks, Alex. Talk to you soon. Everybody, that's it for this week's episode of Hardscape Growth. Till next time, work hard, pave harder. See you, Alex.